Welcome to the Transformational Storyteller Podcast. The stories we tell ourselves and others shape the lives we lead. I'm your host, Dara Lee Lyons. Today, I am so excited to welcome my guest to the Transformational Storyteller Podcast. Salah is a visionary. He is a powerful man who's up to great things, using his platform as a catalyst for creating change um, in communities and for empowering other people to have voices, people who might not always be represented um, in society to have voices to tell their story and to get their message out there. So today I am excited to hear what he has to say about what he's been up to. Um, so I think of very pivotal moments that started me on this journey of doing Salah's Corner in my podcast. And the first one that always comes to mind is 2008, it's November, and I'm at home. It's late at night, and I'm watching, for the first time, a black man take stage as president of the United States. And even in this moment, I can feel my heart, you know, just kind of palpitating a bit because... I think of how emotional it made me. Verse, first as a black man, just to see the opportunities that were there, but also how terrified I was of what could possibly happen, what the public was going to do to him, what the country was going to do to this family, to these young girls. Um, and it catapulted me to want to, to do something more for my community, to tell a different story from what has always been told about people that look like me, people that come from poverty, people that are disadvantaged. And from that moment on, I decided that when it came to political conversations, I wasn't going to be silent. I was going to, you know, dispel some of the, the negative things that were said, you know, when we have conversations with friends and family members of, what politics is or isn't, should or shouldn't be, some of the stereotypes that exist about us. Um, but that really all came to a head in November of 2016. And I woke up the next morning after September 12th, you know, that famous day of September, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I woke up the next day on November 12th, that famous day after November 11th, um, and just, you know, my wife was crying, you know, couldn't believe that as a country we've elected a person that was so vile and so hated and spewed so much hatred to other people, let alone policies, let alone stances, just so negative in the way their mind worked. Uh, my stepdaughters were crying on, you know, they couldn't believe this person was, was president. You know, we went from first black man to an individual who is being an accused of rape, who is just nasty in his approach to women, to black people. And from that moment on, I decided that I can't just talk to my friends. I can't just talk to my immediate circle. I need to start to reach out and build a community that is embracing of everyone, no matter your sexual orientation, no matter your race, no matter your color and wraps their arms around those individuals and shows them you can tell your own story. You can uh, be the cause of change, not just in your life, but in your community as well. And from that moment, Salah's Corner was born. And since then, I've been able to connect with so many different individuals uh, within the city, so many of our elected leaders, uh, business entrepreneurs, uh, HR professionals, um, and it's been a great journey to not only give other people that space to share the troubles that's going on in that life, but give them something to hope for and show them how to navigate that space when they're having trouble. One of the things that I have come to love about my life as a freelancer is co-working. If you, like me, had never heard what co-working was, um, co-working is being able to work amongst a community of like-minded individuals where you're all doing your own thing, but you're doing them together in community. 
surrounded by people who um, you know have great networking opportunities and really just are supporting you in achieving your vision and also if you're a freelancer like the me I used to be um, it's a great excuse to get out of your pajamas and be surrounded by people um, so Kismet Cowork has generously offered $25 off a first month membership to any subscriber of the Transformational Storyteller podcast. So all you have to do to take advantage of that offer is contact them at their website, www.kismetcowork.com, and um, let them know that I sent you there for your $25 off. Thank you so much for being here today. Seriously, thank you for having me. I, I enjoy uh, being able to not just meet new people, but also just storytell. I just love to storytell sometimes. Um, so thank you. Thank you for this. Oh, absolutely. And um, so being that you host your own podcast, yes. right? So Laz Corner, yes. what's it like being on the other side of the interviewing seat? Um, the interesting part is, is on the right here, I'm, I'm thinking, God, do I like talking about myself this much? I don't know. I don't know. How much do I love talking about myself? That's always the, how much do people enjoy hearing about me <laughs> as well? So that's, that's what I, I put myself through on the right over here is Got that constant it. battle. How much do I talk about myself? How much do I not talk about myself? But then I thought, you know what? Like you, you have a compelling story to tell and you, you have a unique story to tell. So it's going to gravitate towards someone. So just, just tell it and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and one of the things that I love about your story is that it's not just your story, right? right. That like the work that you're up to is yeah. actually doing important things in the world and for your community. So to me, it's not the same as you just like, I don't know, talking about your daily experiences. You're talking about things that I think are relevant. Yeah, and it's, it's, that's the journey that I've come across doing this, this podcast is, you know, I take the opportunity to take my story and, sh and explain and connect with people who live that same existence, especially in Philadelphia, being a, a young black man, being a father, being a married man. Um, it is a very specific experience in Philadelphia. Uh, but, you know, also coming from a family in poverty, um, coming from a family where not everyone is educated um, or have a college degree, you know, so there's so, I have so many backgrounds and so many experiences that I've learned to navigate spaces to connect my story with different people from different backgrounds all across Philadelphia. Yeah. Well, and there's something, so when you told your story earlier, you told about these two specific moments. Yeah. Um, these pivotal moments yes. and historical moments. And I wanted to just sort of dissect them a little bit and talk about the moment after Obama uh, took office. And you spoke about those twin feelings, like that sense of joy maybe, empowerment, like seeing yourself represented in some way, and then at the same time that fear. And I wanted to kind of speak to that simultaneous yes. emotional experience. It, it, was, it was tough to feel it, like it was confusing, you know, because it's like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, but also I am terrified. You know, I'm terrified of the, the possibilities, but I'm also just as hopeful for the possibilities, right? So, you know, I, I, I think the, the immediate reaction was, wow, like this, this, is, this is something, this is huge. Like I, I, I saw the, the reaction on, on people's faces that were in a crowd in Chicago when he took the stage. And, and it, it just, you know, for the first time as a, as a, as a American, I was proud. I was, I was extremely proud. Like we, we did it. Like we did something, regardless of, you know, whether you agree or not with, with his policies. You know, it was, we've gotten to this moment where 10 years ago, five years ago, no one was saying there could be a black man president of the United States, yeah. you know, with two black girls, with a black wife. You know, that was, that was unheard of. And to reach that pivotal moment was historic, but also it just connected with me personally. Um, well, but, especially being a black a man, black man exactly. and a father. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And you know, my, my son, I had just put my son down to bed and he was, he was four at the time. 
and I put him to bed, and I, I sat, I sat on, um, you know, I sat on the floor in front of my bed because I just, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't contain myself really, and just like watching uh, election results come in. And when it moment, like I, I, I shed a tear for sure when that moment happened because I just, I was overcome with so much emotion. Um, but I, the, the very next thought was, my God, what's going to happen to this this man? What's going to happen to this family? You know, what what harshness is this country going to put this this family and this man through? You know, he's going to be scrutinized on a level that nobody's ever been scrutinized before. Um, he's going to be held to an expectation that no one has been held to before, and. Um, you know, he's never going to be able to do good in the eyes of some, you know, so I, I, I understood that fear. And then the, the ultimate fear was, oh, my God, somebody's going to assassinate him. Like someone's yeah. going to assassinate this man because that's, that's what you do when you don't like someone. Well, I think it's so challenging. I mean, you said that's what you do when you don't like someone, but I think it's incredibly fraught and incredibly painful when a person is seen as a representation mm -hmm. of a ra you know, a, as a representation of a group of people as right. opposed to an individual. Right. And so I don't know if you want to speak to that. At yeah, all. absolutely. I mean, it, 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 it really, you know, he embodied everything that was wrong with, you know, black America, right? Like every stereotype, especially the most extreme ones, they came out when it, when it came to him. Oh, he's, he's inviting rappers to the White House and it's just, it's the hood now, or he's wearing like a tan suit and, and God forbid, how could you commit such a fashion faux pas? And, and you know, when it came to Michelle Obama, you know, it was, it was the same with her. Like she, she represented all of black women, you know, so she's just trying to tell you what to do. She's angry. It's, they embody every stereotype and then become the, placeholder for all black people and, and you know right. there's a famous thing we're not a monolith right we, we we speak and we we speak differently we hold different ideals uh, we live different existences so it's important to you know recognize that but you know when you reach such a pivotal moment as as an individual you know you, you, t you start to represent all of them yes yes well, and I think it's it's both things. It's like this simultaneous, you talked about hope and terror. And I think at the same time, you know, being a person of color, seeing someone of color take such an important office, it's like, wow, this is huge. And mm -hmm. I see myself, so I'm a writer. And I remember growing up, there weren't really um, a lot of characters in yeah. books yeah. that were representative of my own ethnic identity mm -hmm. as a biracial person. And so, uh, you know, as I got older and then I even wrote my own book, you know, for kids. And, and what's been amazing is like, oh, wow, seeing myself in a situation that I never would have thought possible, seeing someone who looks like me, you know, and I think it's really amazing to have your kids have a family, you know, like a prominent family in office. Right. Like in, it's, right. It almost opens us up to like, oh, I didn't even know that was possible right. that, that, for someone. That representation is important yeah. because, um, you know, understanding the possibilities is so important, especially as a child, you know, coming up, you know, th those possibilities weren't there when I was growing up, you know, not until, you know, he got into office and it was like, wow, that's, you know, these are some possibilities. But I, I take even a, a step back and I think about, you know, I always think about my existence as a young man, you know, living in Philadelphia, going to Philadelphia schools and the public school system here. and you know, you didn't go to school with, you know, editors for newspapers, you know, you didn't go to school with other, um, you know, media personalities or, um, you know, marketing experts or, you know, the professions was doctor, teacher, lawyer, maybe. Um, and that's, you know, or, or sports player, yeah. you know, that those were the, the highlights that you, you strived for. And, and that's all you really talked about when, you know, when you have those career days in elementary school and things like that. So even when you uh, re don't know of the possibilities that exist in those spaces, 
you know, it limits, it severely limits your opportunity. You know, I think about some friends of mine who are, are we had conversations about them growing up and he had a friend that was a, um, their parent managed a, uh, a nonprofit. Mm. You know, another parent uh, was the director of a museum. You know, another parent, um, you know, uh, started their own 501c nonprofit. Another friend, um, you know, was an, an editor for a large newspaper. So as a, as a child, even though my parent may not necessarily have that profession, and I'm not directly exposed to that, I know that my friend's parents have that exposure. And I see, and I hear about, right, you, you, you hear about the stories of, you know, your friend's parents, and you know that job exists. So that's something that I, oh, that's interesting. I want to know, learn a little bit more about that. But when it's not there, and it doesn't exist, for, especially for those kids that are in poverty, what do you strive for? You know, so that, that representation for seeing him reach that, that moment and for my son seeing that, you know, that's all he knows, right? Like as he coming of age and start recognizing what's happening around him, his first, you know, knowledge of anything is there's a black man that's president, you know, versus me. It was like that wasn't, that didn't exist until 20-something years later. And I think you bring up such an <clears throat> important point about just, like, I think diversity is something that can be seen in every area, yeah. right? Like having a diverse number of job opportunities to choose from, you know, having like options in mm -hmm. terms of, do I want to go into this profession or that profession? Like who, it, this, this idea of being able to form an identity with a multitude of choices right. and modes of self-expression, I right. think is really critical. It's, it is, it's, incredibly critical because it, it allows you to figure out who you are Bec that's and that's so important you know we I, I'd like to think that um, you know as a country as a community we're used to going to work you you have a job for stability and that's kind of it right like you have a job for stability to take care of family to retire and you know, provide a safe haven for your children, where I think that mode is somewhat changing and you, you know, uh, career professionals are now jumping from career to career every few years because you don't know who you are. To, who you are today is not who you'll be five years from now. Well, and I think it's an important point because who, who we are and how we identify may be different than who society tells us we are, right? right, right. And so it's th this idea of like individual identity versus representation and public opinion. And I think that's like becomes abundantly clear in the political space. It, it absolutely does. And I, I went through this journey as I started to get into Salah's Corner uh, podcast. And, you know, prior to doing some of the writing that I do and, and, uh, having this podcast born was understanding that my identity was shifting and not you know who I am as a black man but my identity as what I do with myself and you know I initially you know early in my career I worked in a number of different professions I could we could have a whole interview on just the number of different <laughs> jobs I've had but my identity was attached to where I work you know, so when I met people, when I, when I traveled in different circles, when I uh, did some networking, you know, who are you? Well, my, my, my title is this, and I have, a, I have a son. You know, that was always hand in hand. Not necessarily, but that wasn't me. You know, that wasn't my ideals. That was whatever company I was working for in the moment, or, or the title that I held, or it was all about status. And that was my identity. And, I, and, you know, as I have navigated this space, I've come to realize that that's it for a lot of black people. Their identity is the company that they work for and not necessarily who they are as an individual. So breaking away from that and understanding that I'm more than the title that I have today because tomorrow I could be long gone and that you know, that title is now belonging to someone else. It's more about like what the legacy I leave and the impact that I have on my community around me. You know, I could have a great title, 
but what do I do with that title? What do I do for my son? What do I do for you know, those relationships that I build with, with the new people I meet? That's more important of who I am. Well, do you think that the title is seen to be representative of something, like some level of achievement or some level, like, do you think it's... That's what we're told it's, that's yeah. what we're told yeah. it's supposed to be. That's what we're told it's supposed, we're supposed to strive towards. You know, the very traditional of the, the if you didn't, you know, I, I met a young lady at a, at a, um, an event focused on um, expunging individuals' record. So mm -hmm. recently, Clean Slate Law was passed in, in PA, and there was community events on how to really go about that process. They had a number of different uh, people speaking at the event, and they had different tables to have citizens of Philadelphia navigate that process of what that looked like. So I decided to go and show up just to learn a little bit more about the program, and I met a young woman, and her and I had a, had a conversation and one of the first things she asked me was, oh, that you, I, I love what you're doing. I love your podcast. What school did you go to? Mm. And it was the, it's the immediate, like, and then she even caught herself. She was like, you know what, I'm sorry. That, that was very classist of me, right? Like mm. that your, your school, your formal education, or your, your title is who you are. Right, yeah. And that's a norm that's not just prevalent in black America. But in, in the in country as a whole, is those two, those two identifiers yeah. explain who you are and tell your story, but they don't really. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that's a part of your story, but it doesn't tell the whole picture of, of who you are as an individual. Yes, yes. And, well, and who you are as an individual, I think, is, as you were saying, like something that is, like, something that is constantly, we're constantly figuring it right. out. Right, right. And, um, and do you find that you have one, like something that is unshaped? Like there's certain aspects about me as a person that I feel like shift over time. And then there are certain things that I'm just like, oh no, this is unshakable. This has always been there and it's always going to be there. Yes. Do you, there is, there is something very specific that is com very unshakable when it comes to me. And it is, um, fairness. Mm -hmm. I am a big proponent of fairness. And at its very basic rudimentary level, you know, so I, the first thing that comes to mind is um, this moment I had with uh, my fourth grade teacher. This okay, is, yes. This is how early I, I saw fairness and was like, I'm not for this. So we had, uh, we had class elections and, we, you know, there was going to be someone running for president and someone class secretary, which... I don't know what that really meant. So political, grade. even yeah. from fourth very, grade, you're very, very political. Very okay. political, even in fourth grade. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I got good grades and I wasn't very outspoken, which is kind of contradictory to where I am today, which again, shifting identities. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't very outspoken. I got good grades. I was quiet. I did my work. You know, I connected with everyone in the class. So, you know, so I was very friendly with everyone. I didn't necessarily have any like conflicts with anyone, you know, even in, in the fourth grade. And we did these elections and a bunch of people in the class was like, Salah should be president. Should mm -hmm. I, Salah should be class president. Like he's, he gets good grades, you know, he's, he's nice, he's well liked by everybody. He should be class president. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll do that. And my teacher said no. He said, no, you can't run for that position in, in the class. You could run for something else. So I was like, I'm not participating in this at all. Wait, what? what, what like, yeah. I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> Fourth grade, I was told yeah. that I could not because I was too quiet. He deemed me too quiet for to be someone to be class president so I could be one of those other positions in the class. I could not be class president, even though I had people in the class that wanted me that. And so we went through this process of, he said I could be at anything else. So then I had friends trying to lobby me for all of these other positions. And I was like, not only do I not want any of them, I am not participating in this process wow. because you are not going to treat me unfairly. And I never did. And from that moment, you know, I, I, I didn't recognize it in that moment, but looking back, you know, it was a very pivotal moment uh, for me to understand that when I see someone being unfair, I, I, I'm a disruptor 
and yeah. I, 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 I start to disrupt the process. And well, that's interesting that you framed it that way because I was thinking, wow, okay, in fourth grade, you were barred access from participation mm -hmm. and you then, you know, uh, participation in that yes. one role and then you said you know what I'm not going to participate in the whole thing but now I actually see you doing the reverse you're still advocating yes. and you're still saying this isn't okay but you're now saying it in a very vocal right. very like upfront respectful but like confrontational way and it's but it's learning how to navigate that space yeah. and you know not knowing that was present in me at the moment, you know, just knowing that I knew something wasn't right about the situation, but I also knew that I couldn't just stay silent about it. I couldn't, uh, you know, silently go along, even though I know it didn't feel right. And there was something in me in that moment that knew it wasn't right and knew that my silent dissent and going along with it was just allowing someone to do something unfair to me that um, I knew I couldn't live with. Who knows yeah. what, what, what they could live with and what, you know, how it affected them. But I knew that my dissent in some form or fashion was the most important part of that. And as I go through this podcast today, you know, my dissent to certain political norms is less about you know, just speaking out of, about things that's wrong, you know, so I, one of the big parts of this podcast and, and how it was born was finding a space for people to elevate themselves and talk about it, right? Like, we've, we've go through this, uh, we've been taught that you have to be of a certain education, you have to be of a certain background or a certain financial status to engage politically. Um, and if you don't, you're either not smart enough and you're not, you know, it's not the space for you, or you can't talk about it at work. You can't talk about it at family gatherings. You can't talk about it like amongst friends and outings. So yeah. it's like, well, where do you talk about the things that impact you on it every day? Right. right. Like, where do you, where do you go and, and talk about some of these things? So it was today I use that, um, when it comes to fairness is that it's disrupting that space and it's figuring out, okay. No, you should be able to talk about politics everywhere, right? Like, if you can't find health care, if you can't get the, 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 what you need to just live, yeah. why can't you talk about that everywhere you go? Right, right, absolutely. Like, what right. is the, and it's, it's like this thing that infiltrates every element yes. of our existence, yes. and yet, you can't talk There's about it anywhere. Like, where do you, it, right? where, I, to this day, when I, I have these conversations with people, especially when they talk about, oh, you know, we, we don't really want to talk about that. And I go, well, where can you talk about Yeah. It? Let's yeah. go there. Yeah, like, well, tell me politics where. and religion, I feel <laughs> yes. like the two things that are like, essential yes. to our existence as human beings. Can't like, talk about it anywhere. Yeah, right. Because you might offend someone. And that's, you know, when I, when I think of myself as a disruptor, that's what I think of. It's how do I disrupt that, yes. that mindset, how do I disrupt that norm that has been in place for, for some, some decades now? Yeah. And that's what Salah's Corner is for. And it's, it's to show people that, one, you can use this space to disrupt that, but also let me show you how to navigate some of those conversations, right? Let me equip you so you don't feel like you're not intelligent enough, so yeah. you don't feel like, oh, I don't know enough, right? You know that you need health care. You yeah. know that you need proper education. You know that you need you know, good housing. You know that uh, uh, you, you have a nice business idea and you, know, you see a certain community getting access to funding for the, their ideas, but not you. You know that's not fair, right? right. You know those things. Yeah. You know those, those basic things. Speak that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need yeah. to know policy. You don't need to know who supports what. You just need to know what you want for your community and for your family. Absolutely. Well, and I kind of I want to go back to the second part sure. of your story and you know, the moment when you realize that okay, Donald Trump has been elected into office and I want to talk a little bit about how that to to me that moment, it's like a um based on what you just shared about your teacher, it's almost like that same moment for many people, right? Where it's like, okay, I'm I'm no longer 
represented in this space anymore. Like I'm no longer safe in this yeah. space. This is not fair. This is not, you know, regardless of people's political affiliations, I think that like Trump getting into office was very much for many, many people. It was like, wow, I am voiceless right. within this system. It, it, it was to me seeing the women at home cry was mm. something that hit a little bit home because I, I know how it impacts me, right? Like I, I, I know, you know, you, we hear the stories of how he's treated uh, black people, mm -hmm. right? But what that moment showed to me and, and particularly for my household was, you know, how he has treated the different women in his life and how he's, um, you know, vilify them and how he refers to them as you know such beneath you know whoever he's supposed to be um and as a country we decided that that is okay we we will ignore that part of it because i might come out financially better that was was heartbreaking because it wasn't uh yeah we know what this country is capable of Right, like we we are humans, you know. We we understand that, you know. We have not only our biases, but we have some atrocities that are in that's in our past. Mm -hmm. But and our present, and our present, absolutely in our present. Um, and it wasn't. It was less of a. I know. I, I I understand what we're capable of, but like, I can't believe this trauma is still happening. Right, like I, I can't believe that we are still not understanding the importance of associating ourselves with individuals who, um, you know, talk about uh, women as objects. Right, like in, in a sense of, you know, this man was going into like teen pageants and lock in their locker rooms yeah. and and yeah. you know as they're changing, literally as they're changing, teenagers. Um, you know, this man has, has been accused of rape I don't even understand how many times. Yeah. Um, and, and to just ignore some of those, those aspects of his personal life and to elevate him to the highest position in the world was very traumatizing to a lot of women who face that existence every day. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, not just, um, you know, on TV with these different figures, but also in their personal life, right? Like how many bosses have been creepy? How many men in relationships or father figures even have been super creepy and still get like ignored or the, uh, elevated to, to certain statuses? So seeing it at that level was, was traumatic for a, lot of, for a lot of people. And then seeing it from my side of it, it's like, I can't continue to, like how can I be someone who is an advocate for certain types of change and, and, and uh, not like do something about that, not speak yeah. about that and not uh, try to, you know, yeah. disrupt. Really. Right, right. And I think there are a lot of people, you know, myself included, uh, from all sides of the political divide who came out of that election and said, you know what, the system is broken. Yeah. <laughs> like there is something deeply broken about the system. And we were talking earlier about representation and choice. And I think, you know, many people will say, you know, part of the reason that Trump is in office is because there were there just weren't a whole lot of options. Like there wasn't a whole lot of, and I don't know that I agree with or like with that, but but at the same time, I do feel like it speaks to the fact that people are oftentimes making decisions between the lesser of what they perceive as two evils, as opposed to like making empowered choices. And and I, I agree. I, I think people do you know, consider that as the lesser of two evils. You know, I, I think there's a, a group of people who consider it the lesser of two evils. I think there's a group of people who consider that as, as you know, how can I personally gain, you know, mm, from the situation? Yeah, I yeah. will personally gain from this man being in office versus anyone else. Um, and that's where I fault the system for, for being broken yeah. and, and unfair because at the end of the day, it's it's our institution's responsibility to educate us, right, and, and to to show us the the how to navigate these spaces. And if we have a system that 
discourages talking about yes. politics, if we have a system that you know doesn't act exactly teach it, you know, from 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 uh, our education system, like how many eighteen year olds come out of high school with enough knowledge to actually vote, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, if we don't have that system in place, how much can I fault those individuals for being misinformed? Right. Right. Like, if the norm is to not talk about this this stuff, and if the norm is to avoid conflict and def and avoid um, disagreements, how can I? How much can I blame you for being miseducated? Yeah. And if we don't educate people and teach people how to obtain their own education right. about right. politics, then I think it becomes almost impossible to decipher between true, authentic journalism and fake news and, you know, all right. the things that, because people are getting their political information from their Facebook feeds I, or Wikipedia or whatever, you know, and it's not, I don't think it's necessarily anyone's fault, individual people's fault. It's like a systemic problem that needs to be dealt with. And, and certain moments, and I, I I have that argument in my head all the time, where I go back and forth with, you know, who who do we focus our energy on? But I I, I always revert back to, you know, people people are the victim in yeah. this situation. You yeah. know, not being equipped with the ability to decipher fake news from real news. Yeah. Like you're the victim in that situation. You know that that's that is traumatic to a society to not be able to have direct access to real information. Yeah. That is yeah. so crucial to a society, to a community, because if you can't access what's real and what's fake, if you can't decipher what's real and what's fake, imagine, you know, imagine going to school and not knowing yeah. what's real and what's fake, right? Like not understanding what is being taught to you as actual information and having to figure that out going through from kindergarten to 12th grade. Oh yeah, we would absolutely. Be, like, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's, it's My traumatic. geography would be even worse than it is. Like, I mean, you know. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, You know, yeah. so like I, I look at, I always revert back to, you know, yeah, I, I know some of these, some, some people who, who think, you know, in a certain way who have, who disagree with me politically. Um, you know, they don't, you know, oh, I, I can't believe they think a certain way. I can't believe they supported Trump. I can't believe they vote for Trump. I can't believe they don't vote. But at the end of the day, a lot of times that person is the victim because we have a system in place that uh, doesn't promote well enough yeah. because there are institutions in place that do. But there's this, we have a system in place that don't promote the education um, and the engagement uh, active engagement on an everyday basis and and uh, and in multiple circles of our political system. Well, do you know you might know it's I think it's a Thomas Jefferson quote, but it's something about like you can't have a democracy without an informed populace. Um, I don't. I, I think it might be a, a Thomas Jefferson quote, but it's that's. But it's true, it's true. right? Yeah, like you, you can't actually expect people to make a decision, right. make decisions that impact all people right. without you c giving them information. And the information should be, you know, should be bipartisan. It should exactly. be, like, op it's open to interpretation. People can do with it what they will, but at least give them the facts and a forum for discussion. Right. Because it's very clear. I mean, I can't even. Uh, tell you how many times, just on a personal level, let's take politics out of it, I have been operating on a certain set of assumptions and been convinced that I was right and then had someone from my life be like, well, actually, have you thought about it this way? Or like, oh, well, if you do that, then it's going to make me feel X, Y, Z. And, I'm, and, and I take a moment, I take a deep breath and I say, you know what? You're right. Or even if I don't, th don't agree, it's like, well, oh, I, I didn't see that aspect before and I'm still going to do it my way or what have you but at least like being able to have that input feels so essential. It, it is and it, it's it's fundamental to a functioning society. Yeah. Like it's just it's we we don't I, I guess we, don't, we take it for granted because there's so much access especially when it comes to like news and information that's out there. Um, but it's so fundamental to how we grow as a society and how we intermingle with each other yeah. is, is that importance of understanding 
and, and the access of, of information and news and media. And we've, we've, we're at a very, I, I feel as though we're at a very crucial period in not just politics, but just as, as, as a community, as a, as, as a people that, you know, understanding the importance of that access and understanding that, you know, who has control of that information is, controls the lives of, and the outcomes of everyone who's impacted by that information. You know, so I, I, I look at, you know, for instance, Facebook. Right now I'm, I'm on this, this uh, very, like, I wouldn't say a social media, like, ban, but it's just, I'm, I'm just, I have to step away from different forms of social media because of the, the, the way the information is kind of dialed out to people, but, um, you know, Twitter just came out saying that they, you know, will ban uh, political ads that, that mm. uh, you know, report in bad information, right? Like, that's not true. Where Facebook is just kind of like, eh, we, you know, you're putting your money into the system. We're, we're willing to take the, the ad and the money, and it's up to the people who use this forum to decipher what is what. And it's, it got, it's, that's powerful. That's extremely powerful. And I know people take Facebook for granted and, oh, that's not real news or information. But some imagine. Some people do, but um, some people don't. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine the amount of time that individuals spend on these social media platforms on a daily basis. And they're not watching news. They're not, you know, picking up a newspaper or subscribing to some kind of local newspaper, which I'm a huge advocate for. So all of their information is coming from social media, whether they actively know they're watching or looking at an ad or not. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. Well, and people don't know, so I, being in journalism myself, right, like people don't know the rigorous vetting process that is part and parcel of that experience. Right. So I can't just write something and have it be published, right? Like I have right. to write something and then it gets fact checked and someone comes back to me and an editor's like, hey, like wh what are your sources for this, this, and this? And then I have to substantiate that. And that's a far different process. But I think just for the average layperson who doesn't understand anything about what goes on behind the scenes, nor like should they, right? right. If they're presented with two articles, one of which has been rigorously <laughs> fact checked and the other one which was could be entirely made up like they don't know which right. one is is correct right. or verifiable and, and the way social media works is the one that garners the most attention is the one that people will see the most yeah. you know so it's not necessarily relevant to it, it may not necessarily be something relevant to what you either want to see or or something you agree with but because 10,000 people have looked at it and reacted to it. Yes. Well, you must want to see it, right? Like 10 of your friends reacted to it, so you must want to see it. So let me throw it in your face. And then you can now be misinformed by this information yeah. or, or not. You, you don't know. You just know that the reaction was there. So that's, and, and that's the perverse, you know, aspect of social media, which is a really, really crucial to that access of information. And how we, again, you know, individuals, people, us, we, we are the victims in that. We are the ones that are, are being hurt by that. And I, I actively try to disrupt that as much as yeah. possible. Well, and I want to talk about that disruption yes. and what you're doing with Salah's Corner. Yes. And so tell me a little bit more about We'll first tell people kind of like where they can link up with you to hear your yes, podcast. Yes, absolutely. So Salah's Corner is accessible on um, anywhere you find your podcast. Download it now. Subscribe to Salah's Corner. Don't forget to rate and review me on Apple Podcasts. It gets me higher up in the ranking. But also share your feedback with me. I always love to hear feedback, right? Yeah. Like that's how we grow as individuals on information you want to hear. So my email is also realtalk at salahscorner.com. And just um, spell Salah's Corner. For yes, people. that's uh, <laughs> yes. I know, right? Everybody can't spell my name. Um, so Salah's Corner is S A L A A H S Corner C O R N E R. Okay, perfect. And um, and yeah, and so you're utilizing that as a platform to yes. interview individuals about their existence, yeah. right? Like I'm using that platform to connect with people 
and give people, um, my audience, yeah. uh, access to individuals they may not necessarily have had access to. You know, so my, one of my, a few of my last few conversations was um, with, uh, the first one that comes to mind uh, was with uh, Carlos Saponte. He's a okay. school teacher. He has his own podcast in the city as well called We Love Philly. Um, but he also, he teaches uh, um, students between the ages of 16 and 21. Okay. It's their last chance yeah. to get a high school diploma before, uh, before they have to go to the GED route. And, but he doesn't just do that. He also um, takes those individuals because oftentimes people in that program come from, um, you know, broken homes or impoverished families and communities. And he takes them out and does some community volunteering. Wow. And he fully embraces the idea that, you know, he is a part of their community and he's a part of, of impacting their lives and showing them that not everyone has abandoned you, right? There is a community that is ready and willing to embrace you and to, to take you up on that opportunity. So no matter how much you've struggled in the past and you've gotten to the age of 19, 20, 21 and you still haven't gotten that high school diploma, you know, let me show you how to navigate this space and show a community that's ready to embrace you and help propel you on that path. So he does amazing work with that. Um, he's one of those individuals where a lot of people don't know his story and don't know that exists. And it's important to understand that though there are those type of individuals that are out there. And I love that story. And I, you know, I think speaking of stories, this is the Transformational yes. Storyteller podcast. And so if someone were to pick up a book of your life story, right? Like I think every every story Every, you know, like every story has some sort of moral or theme or, you know, lesson that we would want to impart. What lesson would you want people to kind of walk away from? With oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a deep question. I know. Um, <laughs> let's get deep here. Um, the lesson from, from my story so far, because I'm still telling it, yeah. is um, tenacity. I, you know, I've, in spite of where I am today, I've... I've, you know, have dealt with a multitude of different trials and tribulations in my life. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm seven of nine children from my mother. Yes, seven of nine. And, you know, at different moments of my life, I was homeless. I lived in a homeless shelter. Um, I, by the time I graduated high school, I went to, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but I went to at least 10 different schools, wow. whether it was different elementary schools, middle schools, or high schools. Um, I had my son at 18, yeah. and I've, I've gone through a lot in my life. And at every moment, I have looked at the next step as, okay, well, what, what's next? How do, I, how do I not just get myself out of this situation, but how do I, how do I move forward? How do mm -hmm. I take this as a learning opportunity and, and can propel myself to the next step. What's, what is that next step for me? What does it look like? And that speaks to a, a tenacity of wanting to always keep moving and moving forward. Yeah, oh my gosh. And speaking of moving forward, like if anyone wants to connect with you and, um, you know, and follow you, you mentioned connecting on um, Salah's Corner, but like I'd love for you to just kind of give that information again so that people can listen and yeah. get involved. And I know that you're up to not just an individual journey, but a community journey. So I think the more that people can can yes. link up with you the better. So my, my social media is Salas Corner. That's S-A-L-A-A-H-S-C-O-R-N-E-R. -A -A -E That's on all social media. Um, or Salah Muhammad. I'm one of the only ones out there. Except Muhammad Salah, the Egyptian soccer player. Okay, got it. I'd like to be <laughs> affiliated with him in some way. He's great, I know, but um, that's not me, unfortunately. No, so Salah no. Muhammad um, on all social media. And then the podcast is also Salah's Corner. That's S-A-L-A-H-S-C-O-R-N-E-R. Um, I'm always willing to connect with other people. I am working on something. Can I tell you about Please something? Please do, that I'm yeah. On? This is something that I came across from uh, just traveling in these different spaces that I do. I, I just happened to be at a coffee shop, Uncle Bobby's, which I love. Yes, Everybody me check too, it out. yeah. And I ran into this group called Color of Change. It's a nonprofit organization, and they're 
they are a national organization, but they focus on uh, in different local communities on issues that's important to that community. And they really wanted to tackle this asbestos and lead issue in uh, Philadelphia schools. And the more I've gone down this rabbit hole, the kind of more shocked I've been as I've navigated yeah. this space a little bit. And um, initially it, it was, you know, the biggest uproar has been these two schools, SLA, Science and Learning Academy, and Ben Franklin okay. um, closed down and those students had to be shifted to other schools. But it turns out the Enquirer had done this huge expose uh, exposing a bunch of different schools that had asbestos issues and in some cases at uh, higher levels than different spaces where uh, the Twin Towers fell oh, in 9-11. Right, so we we hear about some of those stories where some of those first responders died oh, yeah. from yeah. from that exposure to asbestos, and in certain cases, that's what our kids are enduring in our Philadelphia school system. Oh, so right now, I'm working with that organization and trying to find the best way that our Philadelphia school system and, and district can respond, yeah. and either you know find the funding to repair some of these schools or, um, you know, shutting them down. But Is there a way that people who are listening or watching can get involved with that? Can yes, absolutely. Or? So we, we, um, we hold regular meetings in the community. So uh, follow me on social media. I'll post our, our next meeting. You can also get a, um, really uh, sign up to colorofchange.org okay. and you can see what the latest is happening in your community, wherever you're listening to this. There's a little um, squads okay. uh, in different yeah, communities yeah. across the country and you can figure out what's happening right in Philadelphia. So that's colorofchange.org. Um, but you, I would also say, talk to your teachers, uh, you know, talk to your kids' teachers, talk to your elected officials in Philadelphia. Um, Fund Our Facilities is a, is a coalition between the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers, a number of uh, different elected officials. Um, Derek Green, who also was yeah. an interviewee on Salah's Corner podcast, a city council member at large. He's a part of that coalition. Um, talk, figure out how you can help push that legislation forward. But the one thing that I would say, the biggest thing right now, I think, is ask the question, is your school, is your children's school one of these affected schools that has this high levels of asbestos and lead? Because a lot of parents don't know yes. that that is an issue right now. They don't know that it's their school. And it's essentially any school that was built prior to 1980 have have high level of asbestos in the building and the tile and how the, the the facility is run. So when pipes are exposed, when there's broken tile, kids are now being expo exposed to those fibers and lead and the drinking fountains and yeah. things like that. So oh gosh, thank you so much for letting me know about yes. that and letting people know about that because I do I feel like you know we're back at what we were talking about earlier, which is this intersection between like misinformation or lack of information and not being able to talk about things and not really knowing what issues are. And so I think it's really great for people to be able to get information or at least know that, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know and I want to, like, I care about my kids and I want to educate myself and I want to figure this out and work to create a better environment. That's that so true and even for me, right? So like I navigate the space on a regular basis, but I I didn't know. And had I not been in Uncle Bobby's that day and randomly came across this this nonprofit, I I I have children in the Philadelphia school system. I would have I wouldn't have known, you know, what what impact they that was happening in their lives, you know, because the, the Philadelphia School District is not required to share that information directly yeah. with, you know, parents or, or, or the teachers, mm -hmm. you know, they, they do their own studies. Um, and part of the problem is, is the, the Enquirer did this uh, study and the school district 
and large rejected it, yeah. rejected the results, and only kind of handpicked a certain, a few number of cases that were like the most extreme, that garnered the most noise, yeah. and really didn't address it as a whole, so. Well, thank you yeah. so much for letting us know about that, and I'm like even more committed than ever to getting people to listen to your podcast, because I feel like now they will know about issues as yes. they arise. So thank you again thank you. so, so much. This has been really rich. I feel like I could talk to you for another like hour. Um, I'd but, love yeah. to talk. I, I, you know, I said that in the beginning, so I can talk to you for, for days and not have touch, scratch the surface on yeah. a number of things we yeah. can really hit on. But thank you for, thank you so for having me. I'm so grateful for Salah speaking about his story and his work today. Um, and one of our podcast show sponsors, Just Strong, understands that it's not what, happen what happens in life that gets us down that's the issue, it's the ability to get back up after we have gotten down, which is why their symbol is the squat. And Just Strong, a lifestyle and clothing brand for women is all built upon the premise of getting back up after life gets you down and digging deep and finding your own personal strength. So to take advantage of their 10% off discount, go to www.juststrong.com and enter the coupon code DARALYS10 at checkout. That's D-A-R-A-L-Y-S-E and the number 10 for 10% off. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Transformational Storyteller Podcast. As always, thanks to our episode sponsors, our production team at Rebel Hill Consulting, and of course, many thanks to you, the listener. Whoever you are, wherever you are, I hope you're creating stories that empower you and inspire others.